now making sure I'm in the right order, Adriana. So Adriana it works for Caritas Europe here in Brussels. Um, we know each other through the social platform and, and many other contexts. And uh, Adriana, you have the floor. Many thanks, Jana, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm very pleased to present uh, the experience. To be honest, the um, organizations of Caritas uh, Europa, which are actually uh, not only based in EU countries, but also in non-EU countries all over the European continent, including Russia, Turkey, and such, um, the organizations who have been the first to uh, raise this issue um, to the European level have been Caritas in Ukraine and Caritas in Moldova. And this is why I thought it would be interesting for you to hear about these experiences in that uh, these countries face uh, uh, further challenges and further difficulties also from being non-EU members. So I will start this uh, presentation by shortly telling you a life story, a real story uh, told us by a representative of Caritas in Ukraine. It's a story of a girl called Oksana. She's now 18 years old, but her father left uh, her mother with two small children. And the mother has been working at a furniture plant and supported the family how she could with insufficient income until the plant was closed. She could not find a job anymore and she had to leave the village for the Czech Republic. At the time, Oksana was seven as her, and her young si younger sister, Adriana, was six. So the girls were left with their grandmother. Their mother was an irregular migrant in the Czech Republic and later she migrated to Spain and did not return to Ukraine for a long time. She sent money for the family though but when Adriana turned 15, she committed suicide. She couldn't cope anymore with the absence of both her mother and father. She had conflicts with her peers and difficulties at school and lack of trust in her relationships. Her surviving sister, Oksana, who is now 18, suffers terribly from the loss of her sister, but she's now participating in a Caritas project called Social Work for the Children of Labor Migrants to get support and rehabilitation. She's now more positive about life and she has established some social links uh, with the project staff and with other youngsters that partly help her make up the feeling, make up for the feeling of void and forsakenness caused by the loss of family members. Again, this is a real story and uh, I'm sure you will hear many more today. So um, I will now speak about uh, especially the, the aspect of migration. Uh, migration has always existed as an expression of personal freedom and dignity. But while receiving countries face the challenge of integrating migrant, migrants, home countries are left without human resources. There's an outflow of well-educated people and an insufficient fiscal base for even developing adequate social systems. So it's much more of a, of a structural problem there in those countries of, origins, of origin. The problem that we in Caritas call uh, orphans of migrants uh, is, is relatively new. Um, Caritas organizations in Eastern European countries have observed this problem uh, domestically and responded especially through local projects, but not yet through wider national programs. So let's have a, no, no, just, before, yeah, in Ukraine, just to give you a few, a few data on, on migration. Well, the, Ukraini the Ukrainian pioneers of in the European labor market have been women. A uh, recent study of Caritas Ukraine about the Ukrainian labor migration in Europe concluded that 67% of migration to Poland, for example, was composed by women, most of whom had left their children in the care of family members or other people back home. In the Czech Republic, Ukrainian immigrants are especially men, but the overwhelming majority of them have left the families behind. In Italy, Ukrainian migrants are mainly married women, 83%, who left, again, their children in the care of other people back home. However, 
in most recent waves of migration, there is a new phenomenon of fa a tendency of family reunification in Italy. In Spain, uh, Spain is a country, on the contrary, of mainly family immigration, and official data quote 69% of Ukrainian migrants live there with their family. And in Greece, lastly, a mixed picture emerges. Those younger immigrants between 30 and 35 take their families along, and those aged between 40 and 50 live without a spouse or children, or just with some of them. So with some mixed figures. So there has been a high feminization of migration uh, because Ukrainian women have been more active than men. And this has left children without a mother. When the father, when there is a father, uh, when he doesn't have a job, he will likely start drinking because that's another big social problem in Ukraine. And the family will probably break up as shown by the increasing divorce rates. There is also a progressive influence of the street in the upbringing of children with the, with the paradoxical result that children have money but no love, so they become easy prey of drug dealers. Another social problem in, in Ukraine is the education because probably the best teachers are those who would migrate first. The situation of irregular migration um, into EU countries hinders, is another factor of, of, that hinder, hinders the maintenance of, of family relationships, since labor migrants cannot return to their country of origin for a long time. Now, in Moldova, in Moldova, um, the situation is even worse, I would say. Moldova is the poorest European country with more poor children than adults. And the strong economic recession, high inflation rate, increased unemployment, cuts in social expenditure, lack of opportunities, have produced a tremendous phenomenon of migration away from the country. Uh, this is a phenomenon that affects the whole uh, of the social and demographical and economic situation of the country, because it has an impact on labor force, the family, the future of children, and also, as I said, e the economic uh, and financial inflows, considering that remittances, remittances sent from migrants back to family members in the country, actually uh, make up one third of GDP in Moldova. Um, a study carried by the Organization of the Econom for Economic Cooperation and Development still has revealed that Moldova migrants have the highest qualifications and best professional skills compared to other Eastern European and CIS countries. So you see the magnitude of the phenomenon. As a result, Caritas estimates that there are around 35,000 school-age children who grow up without, without parents. They have both parents abroad. And around 75,000, those having one parent abroad. They are the ones who suffer the most because even though they have money and they can buy themselves the best toys and the best clothes, well, nothing can make up for the, for the absence of their parents. And this form of hidden poverty remains still unknown. These children are not in a situation of material poverty, but they lack love and moral support. Many of them believe they are useless to society. Many of them believe their parents have left because they don't love them. And there is also in, in these countries a cultural heritage to be considered, which derives from the former communist regime, where education was given through boarding schools and daycare, and after the collapse of the communist regime, in a very short period of time, these boarding <coughs> schools were closed and the family structures had been uh, eroded in, between, in, in, in the meantime. So children had no family life to return to. Um, these children express aggressivity, as it's shown by an increase in criminality against youngsters. So what can we do about it? There are no um, appropriate laws. There is no national system to monitor regularly the progress of this situation and implement preventative programs. 
there is a legitimate uh, ground, therefore, to worry about the social perspectives for the children. What kind of families will they build? What kind of future will they have? There is a whole generation in Moldova living with an existential problem of broken identity. And it's easy to understand this will affect the whole society. What's been the, the response of Caritas? Well, as I said, uh, so far it's still locally uh, based. But I can quote a, a good example, which is a workshop of applied creative work in Bender, in the region of Transnistria, where children are uh, invited to come after school and learn agricultural crafts and uh, sewing skills. So these little products made by children themselves are, are sold uh, to, to generate a small income for children. And their arts and crafts and paintings are, are shown in exhibitions. There is also a theater program which help uh, changing the children's attitudes and, and empower them, them to shape their own life. Now, what's interesting in this program is that uh, these same children who receive this kind of light vocational training also um, peer with children in a local orphanage. And they transfer the vocational training received to these latter children. So children teach each other, and they learn about socializing. They learn about building each other's skills. They learn about, so, again, um, encouraging each other. And uh, um, so this is a good example, we think, that, that, that shows um, how, through these through this, uh, interventions, um, not only the access of vulnerable children to income generating opportunities and, and vocational training can be fostered, but also how to build the skills and confidence of young generations to build their own future. And yes, here I would like to show you some photos of, of facing, faces and children, and here's a theater performance, so you can see that. From the side of the receiving countries, uh, I can tell you the, um, a project carried out by uh, the Diocesan Caritas of Rome. It's a kindergarten uh, for children of immigrants who have joined their parents. So that's the other aspect of it. But as I said, more can be done um, by, 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 Caritas, by the Caritas network, and I am concluding now. Um, First of all, we have a duty to communicate this problem to the general public and bring it to the political level. Secondly, a strategic partner could be the regional and local authorities. Perhaps they would be more sensitive to this kind of, of problem. So we should not only advocate for national policies, but also for good initiatives, pilot projects, best practices at regional and local level to fully address the human aspects of this phenomenon. And as Caritas, lastly, we can encourage church communities to establish pastoral activities and animate these children. We strongly advocate for a responsabilization of the countries of origin themselves, but also for the idea of co-responsibility of the receiving countries both in the sense of facilitating family reunification when this is the best solution, and also, on the other hand, allowing families to stay in their home countries in these cases where this is the best solution. So this entails the question of establishing what the best interest of the child in each case. And I will stop here. Thank you.